I'm just asking questions. Forgive me. I'm just asking you questions. Because we have accepted this hook, line, and sinker, and I'm back to my original question. Do we really know what Jesus is up to and where he's going? If you want to fault me for anything in terms of how I look at Scripture, is I'm going to preach Jesus from Genesis to Revelation because he's the hermeneutic. It's all about Jesus. It's not about a great escape. It's all about Jesus. Stay with me. And here's where we are. We are in a place where we have gotten sidelined and distracted by the New York Times, by the Wall Street Journal, by the Daily News, and what we read in the newspapers claiming it's Matthew 24. And instead of starting with the scripture, we start with the news broadcasts and claim it's Bible prophecy. And we'll say amen to anything. will say amen to anything because we have forgotten how to engage the text. There are three things you can never separate. Number one, Jesus. Number two, the Holy Spirit. Number three, the scriptures. When you separate the Father's cord of three strands and pull one away from the other, you no longer have truth. What you have is something you've taken out and now you can't know truth. You can't know truth apart from Jesus, apart from the Holy Spirit, and apart from the Scriptures. So what have we got today? Here's what we've got today. We've got a nation that is now telling us, probably by the Supreme Court, that it doesn't make sense that Christians have a pre-modern idea that marriage is between a man and a woman. Let go of your pre-modern ideologies and just learn how to get with it because if you don't, you are going to be forced to do it. Jesus never spoke about homosexuality. Really? Really? A first century Palestinian Jew who said, in the beginning it was not so, it was male and female. That's all he had to say to a first century Palestinian audience. In the beginning it was male and female. That's a very important theological statement. That's an extremely important theological statement. It's not just a cavalier, in the beginning it was not so. Jesus came to reset the default position. He said, well, Doc, why are you so intense? I am right now getting my second doctorate at the number one leading evangelical seminary in America. And half the cohort that I'm getting my doctorate with all are embracing a low view of scripture and, a, and an absolute embracing of we need to start accepting gay marriage, lesbian marriage, transsexual marriage, evangelicals, some of them tongue talkers. Oh my God, the rapture's coming. No, the rapture's not coming. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm telling you we've been here before. I'm telling you we've got to get our end game together. I'm telling you, if the church is going to be apostolic, we have to get back to the faith once for all delivered to the saints. No additives, no preservatives. Find me any minute we're getting out of here in the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, or the Chalcedonian Creed. You won't find it in the Orthodox creeds of the church. You won't find it because the early church fathers didn't see it. I know I'm getting you upset. But if, if here's, here's where I am. When I look at John, I come to this conclusion. As he is, 1 John 4, so are we, come on, finish it, in this world. As he is, so are we. All right? What that means is that as the body is Christ and the head is Christ, whatever the head has gone through in his journey, the body has to go through the same thing. So if we want to know what's going to happen from beginning to end in the life of the church, read the Gospels and look at what happened from beginning to end in the life of Jesus. We've got a stop to make we haven't made yet. We're not ready. What's the stop? We've got to go up the Mount of Transfiguration. We haven't been there yet. Church is not ready for that yet. We're divided. I mean, here, here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a major deal. 
By this shall all men know you're my disciples. That you love one another. We, we aren't there. We're not there. We demonize the Catholics. They're the Antichrist. I mean, just being honest. I, I mean, when I, when I was growing up in New York, okay, I was told Henry Kissinger was the Antichrist. His, his name filled out 666. Well, if he is, he better hurry up because he's getting too old to create a mass rebellion. Watch. Watch. Before you get to this tomb with Mary, here's something that you need to understand. He walks with 12 men in particular for three and a half years. And for the last three and a half months, he tells them, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And I'm not just going to die. I'm going to die a brutal, horrific, torturous death. If someone you loved told you they were going to die, wouldn't you prepare for their funeral? Just asking you a question. Wouldn't you prepare for their funeral? They did not prepare for his burial. And there was silence in New York for the space of a half hour. <laughs> they didn't prepare for his burial. Here's what the church in the Western world doesn't realize. We think we're more enlightened than Peter, James, and John were in the Gospels. When John wrote his Gospel so that every generation in transition would realize we keep missing the obvious. It wasn't his closest friends that prepared for his burial. There was a lady who had a year's worth of perfume. You got to understand why she had it. Magdalene is not a last name. Magdalene is a title of a woman of the streets out of whom he cast out seven devils. Once he delivered her and she was free, and she anointed him twice. Once with her tears when he delivered her, and once with the spikenard, which she got from turning tricks. No woman in Palestine could afford a year's worth of spikenard. It came from the Far East. You had to have a lot of money. No women in Jesus' culture made that kind of money as Palestinian Jews. But you know what? We read these stories and we never pay attention and connect the dots and start asking questions. The only problem is the early church fathers asked all those questions, and if we would go back and, well, what does Augustine have to say to me? That's our problem. We refuse to honor the history, so we relive it and not realize we're reinventing, we're trying to reinvent a wheel that the early church fathers already hammered out. She takes that costly spikenard, and, and it's in an alabaster box. Let's forget about how much that cost. She breaks the box, all of which is a type and shadow. And she pours it out and anoints Jesus for his burial. From the entire time that he goes into Jerusalem for the triumphal entry, all the way into Pilate's court, all the way into Herod's court, all the way through the scourging, with the smell of the blood, you could smell, smell the aroma of that spikenard. It continued to testify that he was anointed 
for his burial. Stay with me. He was anointed for his burial. What we've got today is a church that doesn't understand if the Western church is on life support, who's keeping it alive? Or is God saying, I need to take the church through a burial and a death so it can have a better resurrection? Or are we trying to keep something alive that God says, you've turned it into an institution. I, want to either, I, I don't want to divorce you, but I need you to know I've divorced before. It won't be the first time I've divorced. And you keep saying you want to be in the center of what I'm doing, but you won't get out on the edge where I am because you're very comfortable where you are, which means the apostolic has to go where we don't want to go. We don't want to be anointed for burial. We want God to prop up our stuff. God, prop up our programs. Prop up all our terminology. Prop up all our stuff. Because we really think we've got an end on the revelation. And Jesus is saying, do you know what I'm up to? And do you know where I'm going? Bless God. He's going to rebuild the temple. You know what it's going to take to do that? Why don't you ask the Palestinian Christians what they deal with? Because last I checked, Abraham was the father of many nations, not the father of one. Do you think Jesus has anything to say about tongue-talking Palestinians who are on the other side of the issue? What about tongue-talking Arabs? Are they second-rate citizens? Because in 1948, a secular parable took place? Just trying to ask you a question. I have a very great faith for Romans 9, 10, and 11 and a great worldwide revival as a result of a turning of the Jews, but not based on a rebuilding of a temple. It's going to be based on them coming to Jesus. And I'm not alone in that belief with the church fathers. If you think they're going to come to Jesus based on the law, then Jesus never should have come to die. I'm just asking you to think. Use critical thinking skills and stop saying amen to everything before you go back and say, is this what the scripture really teaches? Can I keep going? And so, Jesus said, she anointed me for burial. But these guys still haven't prepared. So the if you have been blessed, changed, and imparted by today's message, we would like to extend an opportunity for you to partner with us to impact the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Dear friends, join with us, and together we can change the world. Partner with us and share in what God is doing through Reformers Life Broadcast. Call us at 718-904-8530 or visit us at www.ecclesiaword.org today. by this teaching, and we look forward to being with you again. To request this teaching in its entirety and for a complete catalog of all of our books, CDs, and DVDs, please visit us at EcclesiaWord.org. Remember that you are a reformer and you walk in the anointing of reformation and your faith in God is changing your circumstances.